work groups popping up and saying, you know what? Work matters to God. Uh, you know, we know what we do on Sunday matters to God. What we do Monday through Friday matters to God. In fact, what we do Sunday through Saturday matters to God. And this world belongs to God. The very work that you do on a Monday through Friday level is mission um, <clears throat> at a very significant level. And I believe that to the core of my being. Even if somebody said, well, the mission of the church is to make more disciples, well, then you immediately have to go, well, what's discipleship? And if discipleship is only the spiritual things I do or the words of evangelism that I speak, which I'm for all of those. I mean, I lead a church, we, gotta, we do worship, it's a huge part of what we do. We're training our people um, to do evangelism, but what it does for people when they understand you're doing the work of ministry um, in the very way in which you're a painter and the very way that you're a plumber, all the way to the way, very way you're a teacher is incredibly liberating to them. So to me, if God is reconciling and restoring all things to himself and the church fundamentally is not about bringing the kingdom but witnessing and testifying to the kingdom, then what Christians do on an ongoing basis is saying in everything they do, this is what life looks like under the rule and reign of Jesus, which biblically speaking would be, this is the way God always intended the world to operate. I think that's where Christians have to start and realize it's not just a job. I'm not just trying to um, you know, feed my family and put a roof over my head. It's not, work is not just utilitarian. Work is something much bigger that helps us live into God's design and his desire for his creation. In our last session, Darrow began to unpack God's big agenda to redeem and restore everything that was broken through the fall. And in this session, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the strategy that God uses to carry out that plan. You know, he has a particular strategy that he employs to advance his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And as Darrow said, if you're a follower of Jesus, that strategy involves you. In fact, that's why you were called. You were saved and you were given a position on God's team in order to carry out this plan. That's pretty exciting. The strategy advances from the inside out. Jesus often used word pictures to describe this process of kingdom advancement. In one of those parables, he said, the kingdom advances like a tiny mustard seed. That's something you plant in the ground. It's out of sight. You can't see it. But then it begins to grow and grow and grow until it becomes a huge plant. He said it was like a tiny bit of yeast that you mix into a lump of dough and that yeast multiplies and it expands and it grows until the entire lump of dough is transformed. So God's strategy starts in very small ways and then it grows, it multiplies, it has a huge world-changing impact. And it begins with what theologians call regeneration. The Bible describes our condition as spiritually dead. That's right, a stinking, rotting corpse. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in Ephesians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and your sins in which you once walked. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So regeneration is taking something that's utterly dead and then bringing it back to life. And this is something only God can do, and it's nothing short of a miracle. God's process of transforming the whole world starts here. Unless you're born again, unless we're born again, there's absolutely no hope for transformation anywhere else. And this is why Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. I just have to pause here because I, I'm guessing that some of you who are watching these videos have never responded to God's offer of new life through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, God offers us new life as a free gift. Free to us, that is. It wasn't free for God. He paid for that gift by the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross. Because of his great love, God offers this priceless gift to us. But we have to accept it, and we do this by believing in Jesus Christ. 
We believe that he is who he said he was. We believe that he died to pay the penalty for our sins and that he rose from the dead and he's alive today and forever, reigning today as the great king over all. Now, this is a personal decision that you must make. And if you haven't made it yet, I just invite you, take time to consider it. Do it today. Your life will never be the same. When we bow our knee and we make Jesus the Lord of our life, we simultaneously become a member of a new family, God's family, with God himself as our heavenly father. This family is the church, the people of God through all generations. As I said in my earlier session, we're made for community, and God's purpose for this world is advanced through his community. It's advanced corporately through the blood-bought holy community that he calls the body of Christ, the church. You're now a member of Christ's body. You need it, and you have gifts to share, gifts from others that also you need. Kingdom transformation, quite frankly, is too big for any one person. It's too big for any one uh, church or group or organization or even network. It requires a massive global army that extends through time and across cultures, and that is what the church is. So regeneration and participation in God's family is the beginning point, but it's far from the end. From here, the Spirit begins a work of renovation, and it affects our whole lives. It renews our hearts and our minds. For God's kingdom to advance, we need renewed minds. You know, as social beings, we're profoundly shaped by our surrounding culture. As Christians, however, we're called to inhabit the culture of God's kingdom. We're called to think with the mind of Christ. We're called to take every thought captive and to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In short, we're called to think differently not in accord with the accepted norms and attitudes and behaviors of our surrounding culture, but in accordance with reality as it's presented in the Word of God. And we have to be very intentional about this. As we become aware of false ideas that we've believed, we have to repent. The Greek word for repent is metanoia, and that word literally means change your mind. You know, we tend to think of repentance mainly in spiritual terms, and we think about it in terms of salvation or maybe in terms of repentance from sinful thoughts or behaviors. And these are correct ways of understanding it, but I really want us to think about it in another equally correct way. We have to change our minds. We have to say, I've believed in lies, false assumptions about reality, and I've got to change my mind. I've got to repent, and I've got to replace those false assumptions with the truth. Now, this takes awareness, it takes humility, it takes intentionality, and it's a lifelong process. But this is precisely how we prepare our minds for action, as the Apostle Peter admonished in 1 Peter 1.13. Uh, just a little personal story on this point. I was uh, born and raised in Oregon, uh, a state in the United States. I was saved when I was in high school, and I attended a very secular university. And uh, you know, as a young Christian being discipled, and yet at the same time attending this Christian university, I, I uh, began to uh, have kind of a, a split mind. I had certain things I understood from the Bible, but many other things that I understood from my secular culture that was surrounding me. And one of those things was, was abortion. I didn't see the baby that was growing inside the womb as a baby, a human being. I, I saw it as a product of conception. And I didn't see that there was really any conflict with abortion and my faith. And then I joined an organization called Food for the Hungry. I moved to Arizona and I met Daryl Miller. And uh, Daryl invited me to take a three-day backpacking trip to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I was very happy to do that. And on the uh, hike down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, I mentioned that I don't think I had any conflict with uh, abortion in my Christian faith. What I didn't know was that Darrow actually had gone to jail because he had protested in front of abortion clinics when he was younger. We had a long talk, all the way down and all the way back up. <laughs> and when we got to that south rim, I was pro-life. 
uh, Daryl brought me to the Word of God, and he challenged me. He reminded me of passages like Psalm 139. You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I didn't think differently because everyone that I knew, including the Christians, they didn't have any conflict with abortion until I met Darrow. You see, it caused a bit of a crisis for me because I also wondered how many other secular ideas had I imbibed while I was at college and I needed to kind of sort out. And I'm still uncovering these assumptions that I've absorbed from the prevailing culture. This is, again, a lifelong process, and we need people to help us, just like Darrow helped me. We need to test this against the scriptures to see if it's true. And if it is, we have to repent. We have to change our minds. Now, once our hearts and minds are won over to Christ, our entire lives begin to be affected. Our thoughts, our affections, our behaviors. In short, God's image in us that's been distorted by the fall is progressively restored. And we increasingly reflect the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. That literally is what it means to be a Christian. We're growing to become little Christs. In the words of Ephesians 4, through 24, we're to put off the old self and to put on the new self that was created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, all that I've shared with you up to this point, most Christians understand. In fact, they would say, well, once you get to that point, it's mission accomplished. The goal is to see people come to Christ, get them into churches, get them into a process of discipleship. I'm here to tell you that this is not mission accomplished. This is mission underway. We're just getting started. Once our hearts and minds and affections have been won over to Christ, God's kingdom is then primed to move outward into the social arena. Now, when I use that word social, evangelicals uh, particularly of past generations, reacted against that because they heard social gospel. That's what the liberals do. They do the social gospel. Uh, we do evangelism. They do the social gospel. We've got to break that down. Both of those reactions uh, were an abandonment of the biblical worldview, and we've got to bring them together again. So what is the first and the most basic social unit in any nation? Well, it's the family. So we're to plant the flag of Christ's kingdom first in our families. And we're to say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In my lifetime, the church has tended not to see, uh, tended not to see our work in the family as a vital part of this process of Christ's kingdom advancing. In fact, we've tended to put it below the sacred secular line. And because of that, we've not looked to the scriptures for how we're to order our family lives. Rather, we've tended to absorb those norms and practices from our surrounding culture. And this has been a massive problem. How we think about sexuality, about children, about birth control, about divorce, all of those things tend to align much more with the prevailing culture than they do with the scriptures. This was my experience anyways. I remember my premarital counseling with Kim, my wife, and during that time we did some terrific exercises to learn about one another's personality and what our love languages were, how to manage conflict, all of that was good. But what I really needed to see uh, was what marriage was in the scriptures within the framework of the biblical worldview. I needed to understand that. I needed to understand what my role as a husband was and a father within the framework of the biblical worldview. Well, later I came to begin to understand these things. God graciously taught me through on-the-job training, understanding that my role as a husband, for example, is intended to be a mirror of Christ's relationship to his bride. Well, that was revolutionary. So was grasping a biblical understanding of children and my responsibility as a primary educator of my children in many other areas. Let me just be very clear about this. Some of the most important work that you will do in your lifetime is the work you will do in your home. And because this is such a foundational vocation, and we all share in it, we're going to give this some greater focus and attention later on in this course. I won't unpack it much further here. Now, maybe you're hearing me and you're saying, but I'm single. 
what about me? Surely there must be something I can do as a single person to advance the kingdom. Absolutely. God uses all of us to advance his kingdom, whether we're married or not. Jesus himself, of course, was never married, nor was the Apostle Paul. And I think you could make a pretty good case that they had a significant impact on advancing the kingdom. But then again, none of us are really single. We're all part of families. First, we're part of our birth family. Even if we're not husbands or wives, we're sons or we're daughters, we're brothers or sisters. And our work is to live in obedience to Christ first in those most basic relationships. And we're part of God's family, and that's core to our identity. And so we have to function in that family according to the principles of the kingdom as well. So really, family is for all of us, whether we're married or not. So once our families are won over for Christ, then kingdom transformation is primed to ripple outward into every sphere of society. Somebody once said, the greatest single statement that most people will make for the cause of Christ in their life, either for good or bad, is how they do their work. The greatest single statement that most people will ever make in their lives for the cause of Christ is how they do their work. Because of the sacred secular divide, work and vocation, this aspect of God's strategy has been neglected by the church, as we've said throughout this course. And we really must see this come to an end. As Darrow said, we've lost the biblical view of vocation. We see calling as applying to missionaries as pastors, but not to accountants and electricians and carpenters. And we have almost no idea of what the cultural commission really is, much less how it relates to the Great Commission or to my life. And that's a big reason that we felt led to develop this course, because our work is absolutely vital to the advancement of Christ's kingdom. Every valid vocational area offers opportunities to advance Christ's kingdom. Every Christian has to examine the gifts and the opportunities that God has given them and develop them and exercise them in this world for the glory of God. When Jesus commanded his disciples to uh, he commanded his disciples to make disciples of all nations, he had this whole process in mind. We're to see God's kingdom ripple outward into every sphere of society. So where does this process end? Well, not on this side of eternity, but on the other side. And there we're promised in Habakkuk 2.14 excuse me, 214, that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. We have to lift our eyes to this horizon. Yes, of course, we must do evangelism. We have to plant churches, but this is not enough. We have to press on towards this goal. This is our prize. 